and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath. Today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to explore Australia's hallucinogenic toads, New Zealand calls foul and voter fraud, and a Massachusetts landmark has its roots in animal history. All right, welcome back. Let's go. Hey, welcome back. This is our first episode back from our holiday break. It is January 2021. And today's episode is actually inspired by a couple of questions that I had brought in either in person, hi Zoe, or via text message, hi Jocelyn. Um, So I'm hoping that if you guys also have ideas that can foster some really cool story ideas for the show, All of that information is either in the description of today's podcast or any of the episodes, truly, or that you listen to the end of the podcast. That way you can figure out how to submit your story ideas, and they just might make it on the show. And if you want me to give you a shout out when you submit, go ahead and leave your name. I'm happy to shout out anybody. And that goes for the kids at the Healy School in Somerville, Massachusetts. Hi, everybody. The third graders had invited me to come in. We talked about wombats with their square poop. We talked about frozen falling iguanas. And we had talked about Mrs. O'Leary's cow. And all of those are past episodes. So if you wanted to go back and re-listen, I invite you to do so. But if you have ideas, like I said, you can check the description or you can go ahead and submit those based on the information at the end of the podcast. But as we do every week... We are going to talk about some really cool things. We have three segments today. The last two are both South Hemisphere heavy. We're going to be in Australia. We're going to take a trip to New Zealand. But first. Big shout out today to my friend Zoe. Zoe really wanted me to talk about her favorite adventure during covid She and her mom went to visit a beach. It's a beach that lots of us in Massachusetts have been to or have at least heard of. But like most beaches, we might not have given much thought as to why it's called what it's called. I mean, let's look at some other beaches throughout Massachusetts first to paint a picture. White Horse Beach in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yes, that's where the pilgrims landed. And Plymouth Rock is very, very tiny compared to what you might have had in mind. Given Plymouth Rock was a place where the pilgrims debarked their ships, you might think that it would be more of a cliff or a giant boulder. But it's comically small if you see it in person, until you realize that it's just a piece of a boulder that had been broken into other pieces to go to museums and people's pockets all over the country. But back to Whitehorse Beach. We know that there aren't white horses just running wild up and down the beach. I've been there. It's depressingly short of horses, white or otherwise. It did get its name, however, from a woman who was rumored to have ridden her white horse into the sea after her father refused to let her marry. Luckily, it's just a rumor and not founded in fact. But let's look at another beach, Crane Beach in Ipswich, Massachusetts. It's called Crane Beach not for cranes, the birds, but instead of Cranes, the family, who established the beach and gifted it to his son, Richard Crane. So Crane Beach, not named after birds, despite lots of efforts to save birds on this beach and nearby shores to save birds like the piping plover. So when I dug into Zoe's favorite beach, Dead Horse Beach in Salem, Massachusetts, I expected to find either a rumor or a weird misdirect, but no, it is actually about dead horses. Salem, Massachusetts, it's famous for the Salem witch trials where 14 innocent women and five innocent men were hanged or crushed by stones after being found guilty of practicing witchcraft. So if you were to go to Salem, Massachusetts during the non-pandemic times, you would see that the streets would usually be busy with tourists with witch hats or my other car is a broom t-shirts or tchotchke cups that look like tiny cauldrons. It's also a place where any Massachusetts resident absolutely stays away from between October 1st and November 1st, as everyone who loves witchy, dark, occult, Halloween-y things, the creeptascular, the spooky, the Halloween puns for days, will go and flood the streets. 
The fake spider web streets, fake skeletons on every tree, and lunch specials with names like From the Grave. A double shot of espresso in your hot chocolate cookie crumb garnish to look like soil from witches' final resting places. Sip up if you dare. So the name Dead Horse Beach fits right in this town. In the 1850s, people, as much of Salem is still noticeably pedestrian-friendly because it still uses many of the old carriage routes for walking, and the layout is still very old-timey colonial, and people would use horses for transportation. Salem was also part of a shipping terminus where goods could unload into the carriages from the docks and out to the United States by way of horse, oxen, and other ships and trains. There was a beach away from the town where deep water collided with the shallow waters of the river's mouth. In the 1850s, the beach was called Horse Beach. Not necessarily a nice place to ride a horse away from the hustle and bustle of Salem City, but instead it was far enough away from the townsfolk and the city that dead horses could be buried and not bother townsfolk with the smell of decay. The name, Horse Beach, eventually embraced its full truth by earning the legitimate name of Dead Horse Beach, which fits right in Salem with other landmarks like Gallows Hill and Plank Alley. And Plank Alley is actually not as dark as you might think once you realize it was the wooden planks that were put down on unpaved, very muddy parts of town to help people get from place to place. But given the other names, Plank, Gallows Hill, Dead Horse Beach, they all seem to fit right in on this historically interesting yet touristy, kitschy New England town. What animal names are landmarks or destinations in your town or state? If you have some, send them into bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. We'll cover some more in future episodes, like Dogtown, Massachusetts. But please tell me about more. I think this is super cool. And before we start this section, a big shout out to my dear, dear friend Jocelyn. Hi, Joss. She sent this in, so big, big thanks. I wasn't quite sure how to do this initially, but once she pointed me in the right direction, it was awesome. So thank you, Jocelyn. Poor Queensland, Australia cannot get a break from invasive species. Cane beetles were destroying Australia. So Australia had a great idea. Release 3,000 cane toads into Queensland, Australia to control the beetle population. Look, I seriously think people who do this sort of thing have never heard the song, There Was an Old Woman Who Swallowed a Fly. It doesn't go well for the woman, the fly, the cat, the bat, the spider, the dog, the everything, and it definitely doesn't go well for Australia. 3,000 cane toads released into Australia where they proved terrible at eating the destructive beetles, and they're really, really, really good at reproducing. Like rabbits, but decidedly not nearly as cute. This might not be a problem. They're toads, right? So what could go wrong? Oh, right. I'm sorry. I buried the lead. These are three-pound poisonous toads. They are literally gross embodied. They are totally fine in their native habitats like the southern United States, but in new areas like Australia, they are running rampant. And while they breed like rabbits, if predators try to eat them, they are rendered, well, dead from eating these giant poisonous warty beasts. They also have eaten lots of other bugs, so just not the beetles that they were supposed to consume, which means less food for native species that are not able to compete with cane toads. There are documented cases of pet dogs getting a little too curious and cozy with these frogs, and from what we can observe, getting super loopy on toad goo. So I'm pretty sure when you ask your dog to go on a trip with you, that's not exactly the one they were thinking. And... Sadly, lots of dogs have died, too. And while few humans have died from the toad's poison, the toxin is incredibly painful to humans. And because Australia, some people have eaten these toad's eggs and have died from them. So why are these toads so poisonous? Well, bufotenin is just one of the toxins these guys ooze, and it's a Schedule 9 drug under Australian law, which puts it in the same category as heroin 
and LSD. The most notable effect are seeing things that aren't there or hallucinations, which means lots of people who want to see what hallucinating is like would risk toad licking just so that way they can see flying reindeer or UFOs. But because these toads are incredibly poisonous, the bufotenin, while toxic, isn't the only chemical that is secreted meaning other toxins which come out of the toad in larger quantities compared to the teeny quantities of the hallucinogenic chemical are definitely bad. Bad, 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 bad. So don't do toads, kids. And while the chemicals secreted by cane toads and other poisonous toads are used in pharmacology, they are used in their purest form, not straight from the source, meaning... When doctors and pharmacists and scientists use this drug, they're taking out all of the other toxins and they're just using the bufotonin to help people with serious medical conditions. They're not having their patients lick toads. So if you ever see an advertisement or are curious about trying toad licking, you might want to check out the side effects. None of these are made up. Imagine a commercial on television coming up. A suburban couple riding bikes in the woods, lots of toothy smiles and hugs, and over the images you hear a very familiar voice. Totatol or bufotinine may cause nausea, constricting of blood vessels, euphoria, anxiety, amnesia, panic, the feeling of a heavy weight pressing down on your entire body, turning purple, immediate need for resuscitation because your heart couldn't put enough oxygen into your body, cardiovascular problems, chest tightness, cardiac arrest, weakened muscles, adrenaline rush, seizures, constant unrelenting vomiting, death, and most important, the risk of being photographed and circulated on social media licking toads. Check with your doctor today to see if Totatol is right for you. Psst, it's not. Even that one of the biggest impacts from the toads are that they kill predators who think these are just your everyday three-pound toads. Mmm, a tasty lunch. A lunch that backfires in the worst way possible. Researchers have tried to find ways to teach predators to just leave the toads alone. And one way they have done this is by making cane toad sausages. Get your cane toad sausages. Cane toad sausages right here. Why settle for regular sausages when these ones are walk on the wild side? Will you see God or see God? Add a Coke and a side of fries, $2 extra. Essentially, these little experimenters wanted to try to get native animals to eat these sausages that have a little bit of toad with a chemical that makes animals super sick. They're hopefully teaching these animals not to approach, lick, eat, consume, or otherwise interact with these toads. Australia does have the occasional contest where people can show off their cane toad traps for a prize, but with over 200 million of these pesky creatures, they are going to need a lot of traps, or maybe just a few YouTubers who can catch these venomous toads for views, subscribers, or monetization. And maybe those YouTubers could also encourage people not to approach, lick, eat, consume, or otherwise interact with these toads. Don't forget to like and subscribe. So you might have heard the term election fraud or voter fraud in the United States presidential election. And while there has been no evidence of voter fraud in the 2020 presidential election, there is one case of voter fraud that turned New Zealand upside down, ruffled some feathers, and shined a light on ballot box stuffing. Ballot box stuffing is where one or more people vote multiple times for the same candidate to hopefully help them win. The race? Bird of the year. 1,500 votes came in for the small bird native to New Zealand, the spotted kiwi. But the culprit wasn't very smart as they used the same email address to cast 1,500 votes. They must really love the spotted kiwi or might have even been one themselves. I mean, the email address was iamakiwi at ebird.com. Maybe that was a clue. Once the illegal votes were disqualified, one bird benefited. The kokopo, a rare nocturnal bird, which happens to be the only flightless parrot in the entire world. That bird rose to the top and stayed there once the illegal ballots were removed. 
they are critically endangered, and they are often called moss chickens, which paints a super cute picture of this bird. The kakopo aren't the only endangered species in New Zealand. It turns out that 80% of the birds in New Zealand are at risk of extinction. This Bird of the Year contest helps the country pick out one bird to put their focus on and raise awareness. Yes, awareness on that one bird, but also have it be the face of environmental caretaking and stewardship for an entire year. It's important to consider pollution and climate change as dangers to us all, and the Bird of the Year will be the little beaked face to help these efforts continue to save birds all over New Zealand. Due to an immense conservation effort, the Kokopo bird went from dangerously low numbers of only 50 birds in the entire world in the late 1990s up to 213 today. That is a big jump, but they are still in desperate need of help. Which might be why after the voter fraud was confirmed and the 1,500 votes were disqualified, the Kokopo was the winner of the Bird of the Year contest at birdoftheyear.org.nz. Yay! They won this event. Now let's see if we can help them win survival. So thank you so much again for joining me this year on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, interesting geography that I should know about, or wacky animals in the news, please send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at Bewildered Pod, Bewilder Beast Pod on Facebook, and Bewilder Beasts on Instagram. I am Melissa McHugh McGrath author of Considerations for the City Dog, a great book if you have dogs and you want to learn more about them. I'm also the co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club and creator of Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from NPR.org, SmithsonianMag.com, The Patriot Ledger, Patch.com on Dead Horse Beach, NationalGeographic.com, Arizona Addiction Center, and io9.gizmodo.com. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episodes. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz, and interstitial music, as always, is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and please share with your curious friends. You know, all those things all those other podcasts tell you to do. Thank you so much for listening.